Lord God, our Heavenly Father, give you thanks for this day. We are grateful for this time to be together, for safe travels, for getting us all here, and now the time to study your word. Bless us as we dig into the text of Scripture that we might grow in our faith and our knowledge, our understanding, that you would be glorified in our time together today. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I think today we're finally going to wrap up uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. We've been here for quite some time. I think this is the fourth week maybe we're in this. Um, Mostly, I think we just have to hit this last verse, uh, verse 10. They asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. And just as we were letting out, there was a question, does this have any implications, is there anything to say for us today about our giving uh, This was the Jewish uh, community asking Gentiles to take a collection for the poor, specifically the Christian poor in Jerusalem. This act of giving was meant to be a sign of unity. This was a bunch of Gentile Christians gathering together to support a whole bunch of poor Jewish Christians. And so, in giving, they were saying, hey, we're part of the same group. We're in this together, even though we're divided by time and space and uh, even divided with resources, um, we're seeing this together. So, um, I gave it a very quick answer last week. Yes, yes, this has implications for how we give and um, how we use our finances today. Um, but let's think about that a little more. How else can you see maybe our giving as a sign of unity? We're, we're all working toward the same goal. Um, inwardly, um, within our parish, to support the, the education of our, our, of our families. Um, So within our congregation, within our congregation, potentially externally, to make an impact in our community. All right. So uh, we'll talk about externally in a moment. We'll split that up into a few categories. But first and foremost, we've got within our congregation, we give as an act of unity. What we do here together, we do as the church. Not one faction in the church wants to do that, and another one wants to do that. So I'm only going to give to this category of the budget instead of, hey, we're in this together, even if it wouldn't be my first preference. Because we're part of the body of Christ together, I'm going to support the work that we're all doing, whether it benefits me, whether I see a direct connection with it or not. In, in keeping it internal, <coughs> I think of the the physical plant, which is this building, this staff, but then also what about Lutheran Bible translators or Lutheran Women's Missionary League? Yeah. What what was in... So... Within our goals as Lutherans. Yes. So within our congregation... um, Let's, let's slowly expand the circle. We've got our congregation. But what else do we have in our same building that's started by our congregation? Joyful Hearts. What an outreach opportunity that is. You know, the, the witness that uh, Becky and I can do to the kids every single day, giving them that Bible lesson, let alone what the teachers do there. It's a wonderful opportunity to show some unity there. But let's branch that out um, within the congregation, within, uh, let's go the next level out, um, at least within the church. Let's go to the circuit level. That, did you know you give to the circuit? Circuit Mission Council. Yeah, so we've got uh, an organization called the Circuits Mission Council. Uh, that's actually the Big Rapids and Muskegon Circuits, not Muskegon, Manistee Circuits, joined together, and we support three different congregations plus a campus ministry within our circuits. 
So even though we are not directly benefiting from any of that, we are giving to support the work of the church in that wider sense. You're also giving to the circuit by saying, hey, pastor, we think it's valuable to go to those circuit meetings once a month. Um, do you give of my time, if that makes sense? Um, you allow me to go to these things to not only be refreshed myself, but to give to the circuit, to work within that larger uh, group of people there to support the, the ministry that goes on here. So I want to interrupt you for you, but I want yeah. to step back <clears throat> one more to within the congregation. Okay. Idea. I, some of us of a certain age came up when uh, the model in Acts, where the Christians held all things in common, mm-hmm. was the idea that should be emulated. That is almost a communal thing to the extent of we are going to take care of each other yeah. collectively, first and foremost. Yes. And that was even what the apostles <clears throat> yes. taught, that we, we need some people to take care of us, first of all, yes. the believers, yeah. the, the, the specific body of believers. I remember when I was in college, the radical Christians were those who said, uh, the church isn't the place, it's our communal it's our Christian community, mm-hmm. our Christian community, local we'll as or something like that, mm-hmm. Christian community, uh, where they wrong. It doesn't work out very well, unfortunately. Yeah. It's yeah. all a major man. But. Well, we've got a, a compassion fund here, a benevolence fund, where we give to support our members. Um, we don't. You know, publicize, make a big deal about it, but there are times that our members come to us and say, hey, I'm struggling with this, can you help us out? <clears throat> and we as a church say, yes, absolutely. Could we be more aggressive than that? Should we be more aggressive than that? Maybe. Maybe. Yep. Um, a lot of it happens uh, less formally. Uh, a lot of this giving, supporting of one another happens not within, I'm going to go to the church office and the church office is going to grab whatever they need, but... Uh, a lot of it happens within Christians, just one person to another. Of I see a need there, I have the ability to meet that need, and I'm going to meet it. Um, so we've got members that help others uh, with their budgeting process, or get their groceries for them. Um, we see the Christian church, even apart from the formal structure of church, doing this very thing. Should we be more aware of it, open to it, active in it? Probably so. Um, do we need to say that means you must give more to the church's benevolence fund, compassion fund? I, I don't know that it necessarily has to show up that way, but we're in this together. And the more we can support and care for each other, the better. Yeah. The um, love in the name of Christ has many, many churches that are Yep. They have, I don't want to say a specialty, but a certain area that they have um, boots and coats. Another one may have um, detergents and toilet paper. Right. <laughs> the things that aren't covered under your EBG card. Yep. And um, with the benevolence fund, occasionally our church would be called because there's maybe a person that has just gotten a job that needs hard, yep. hard shoes. Experiencing hardships. Yes. Steel toe boots. Hard toe shoes. Hard toe boots, which are a couple hundred dollars. I mean, they're right. expensive. Yep. So, Love Inc. is a wonderful organization that gathers resources on behalf of many local congregations. Um, one of the great things about Love Inc. is not just that it does that, but it does so for more than just Christians. You don't have to be a Christian to go to Love Inc. So that's a, a way for churches to reach out into our community, not only to support each other, but to support that community and meet the needs of those around us. So, I, I mean, we could go down the line here within our congregation, within our circuit, within the, the Michigan district. Um, 
although you didn't initially agree to this, um, you let me out to be the chairman of the All Pastors Conference this last October, which took a lot more time than I would have liked to admit uh, to get that all arranged and speakers and all that. You participate in the life of the district in giving of me, let alone we send money to the district each and every year. Um, we do the same thing on the synodical level. Uh, level. With the LCMS, um, I get to be the uh, circuit voter for our, our circuit. I get to go to the synodical convention this summer in beautiful Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> We support district synod-wide um, things like not only the synod itself, but Luther Bible Translators, LWML, there's Luther Women's League. Um, there are all sorts of organizations and mission outreaches alone supporting a missionary itself. Um, this is one body of Christ giving so that another body of Christ might be supported, upheld, grown. Uh, Anna's cousin is a, a missionary in, in, down in... Um, in Puerto Rico, and their church is just growing leaps and bounds, um, and, and it's wonderful to see. And I know we've got lots of missionaries who support your Bible translators. And get coats and get into Eagle Village and the hospital and yep. Oasis. So. Yep. The giving that Paul is talking about here, this remembering the poor, well, first and foremost, it, it's a financial thing. Um, he tells the Corinthians that he told the Galatians to set aside a little bit of money every week, and that way when he comes, you've already got some set aside for that. Um, we don't have any other record in Galatians of this being the strategy, um, but it's obviously a financial need, but we recognize there's something more than just money that we can do. Giving of our time, our resources, our skills, our talents, all these sorts of things we can use to support the church as a whole. So we've got... Within the LCMS, starting in our congregation, going out from there, we've got a start of in our community with love in the name of Christ, love in ink. Um, yes, sir, we support the seminarians. Yeah, yes, yeah, seminaries in here, synod wide, absolutely, and, and the scholarship part that goes to people within the district, even uh, going to Concordia's, um, absolutely. Um, Pastor, we also um, uh, we depend on the church to balance these things out or help balance these things out for us if every Sunday I put my envelope in the plate and marked it only for sinning or only for loving or whatever that that, that small area is or that there he is uh, then you leave those others I, I, I like it to uh, animal nutrition a little bit where you know, we talk about staves of the barrel well, which stave did the water run off at what level, level, what level? Which state is broke off? Well, if we're not showing that whole barrel up, we end up running water out in one direction and not taking care of home business of the other. So there's there's always that, that balance. Mm -hmm. So as, you know, the general fund is a safe way to go because some of those things are, are metered out, but then you yep. have those other, other, pockets, other pockets to uh, take care of. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the thing is, we can fragment our giving so much that it seems like it doesn't help anyone at all. Because it ends up, if we're giving a dollar to 700 organizations, well, that's, that's great that they're each getting a dollar, but is that going to impact as much as giving one organization 700? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, part of this happens within the church scale of we as a, a church pool together and say, here's some of the ways we can bless those around us. Um, within our community, we've got Love Inc., we've got uh, this new one, Sleep in Heavenly Peace, that we're doing. <coughs> baby bottle. <coughs> yep, a baby bottle for that's life resources. Yeah. For Friends Ministry of Wasaki County. Healing Private Wounds. So we give to a whole lot of different organizations. We try to reach out to say, you know, we don't agree with every one of these organizations 100% theologically. 
Now, some of these are church-based things, and others are just community things that, that we're recognizing in need. But we're seeing okay, this is part of who we are as Christians, that we support one another, we care for one another. It's part of who we are as Christians to support our communities, to meet the needs of those around us, whether or not they're part of the body of Christ. Um, some homeless shelters will give out meals only after you sit through a church service. I know the Rest Commission in Lansing, my church always went there, that was our one of our mission projects. Uh, we'd get the meal ready while everyone is going through the church. <clears throat> no food unless you hear Jesus first. <laughs> they do the, what they do for a reason. I, I get that. But there's something also to the fact of, hey, we're giving because we're here to give. Um, now, we're here to proclaim Jesus, too, for sure. And, and that never takes the back seat. However, um, taking a look at the broader spectrum of what we're able to do together as, as God's people, as part of the church, it doesn't hurt to say, you know, I don't need to focus on that great right this very minute. Let, let me need to be Let me care for those around me physically so that they can then, you know, listen to Jesus. This would have been a chance to unite the church. They had the big divide between the Jews and the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And to give someone money does kind of open their heart for you. You know, it's yeah. it would have been a unifying thing that the yes. Gentiles said to Jerusalem. Yes. Yeah, and so giving is. <laughs> we often think about stewardship as. Well, we've got to give money to the church now. And it's just, it's fall, so there's got to be a stewardship campaign, whatever it is. Um, and yet, giving can express so much more. That act of unity, that the, the ability to bless others with what God has blessed us with. Um, having gone through seminary myself, uh, one of the things that I love to tell people is, is you see firsthand there the generosity of God's people. How am I going to pay for this? I don't know, but someone just sent me a check in the mail for however many thousand dollars it covered a need. It is incredible to see the church supporting the church. And when we can not only do that, but then let others see, hey, just so you know, this is going on. We're part of something bigger than ourselves. We're united with the church as a whole. That inspires more generosity, and not only that, that we give, but that we receive as well. It fosters a, a greater sense of community and connection with those around us. I uh, this is the the bomb that I went to drop here because it, and it comes from my brother-in-law, okay. actually. But now there are so. With, with every one of these that you listed, the, the, the thing is they are church-based or they're Christian-based. There are so many organizations out there now that are either not church-based or actually corrosively yes. undercutting yes. the gospel. I think of things like UNICEF, um, <coughs> the, uh, what, what's the, there's a, there's a, I should have taken a list, but there are yeah. lots of charities out there out yeah. there that uh, praying for the American Red Cross, things like that, that Christians should not support. My brother-in-law's formulation is this: if you give money to a non-Christian charity, you are simply making someone more comfortable on their way to hell. That's pretty harsh. But it's true. It is. You give some, yeah. Jesus even said, a cup of cold water in my name. Yes. Yeah. And, and when you get to things like UNICEF that are proclaiming things that are antithetical to the gospel, that are leading people to perdition, Christians should not support those evil organizations. Right. So it involves a level of awareness on our part. You know, we just see the, the front face of UNICEF. Oh, that's a great organization, isn't it? Here's a poor starving kid. Yeah. Um, but coming yes. with that is a lot of evil baggage. Yes. 
there are plenty of good Christian organizations, yep. and Christians have to be discerned yep. in picking what they support. Yep. Um, it's, it's, there's my speech. There you go. Well, and, and it is also possible to have uh, a, an organization that's not Christian, but it's also not anti-Christian. Right. To, to, to be, they yeah. should be on the bottom of your barrel too. Yeah, exactly. That yeah. yeah. cold water has got to be in Jesus' name. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, you talk about any sort of caring for neighbor type program, and chances are there's a church active in it somewhere that could use funds. Yeah. Um, the fact that being on the inside of even some of our local churches are having to look at some of these local groups. I can't give this up anymore. Yeah. They, because I know they're not Christian, and many of the people there are antagonistic to Christian guys. Right. They. So this gets back at <coughs> extra organizations giving to the congregation is one thing. It's another to I see you've got a need. I'm going to meet that need. To actually know someone, to interact with them, to be able to to speak to them and proclaim Christ to them and say, Hey. Uh, I love you, Jesus loves you, and we're going to take care of this. Because he's taking care of me. It's great to go through the church, and, and I please don't hear me say don't give to the church. Uh, that's not what we intend. But if there's that question, why not just meet a need? Um, that also assumes that you're in the community, that you know the needs, that you're interacting with those different than you. Uh, most of us are very well secure in our lives. We're, we're not struggling as greatly as some others are. Uh, so to be present in our community amongst those who are different than us gives us this opportunity to proclaim Christ, to proclaim our Christian unity. Uh, you know, the other question I, I've not touched on yet within this is what about cross denominations? Should we give to support the Salvation Army, say? They've got a different set of theology than we do. Is it Christian? Yeah. Where's the line? Well, should we support the Mormon Tabernacle Choir? Uh, they got great music, don't they? Some of the same hymns we sing. Why not? Well, Mormon Jesus is not Jesus as we know him. Uh, so yeah, it does take that level of awareness. And we do need to be aware of what we're giving to, what's the purpose. Um, yes, it needs to be, but it also must point to Christ. This is, you know, remembering the poor within the church, these Christian saints in Jerusalem. Um, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all wrapped up in here. And it's worth us thinking through how we give, why we give, and to whom. Uh, and, and how we can spur one another on towards uh, giving for the sake of Christ more than, oh, I got my name on the building now. And, and at this point, I wish to be succinct. I'm not always known for that, but uh, the kind of piggyback on what, what uh, Mr. Tachman said, um, as I've grown older, I have to examine not only what's been said here, but also where I can make the most impact. I, what I'm getting at is, I believe in veterans' causes. Mm-hmm. So to give to a paralyzed veterans, um, my dad's heavily involved with uh, receiving uh, DAV services, and he being a Vietnam era vet. So, so once again, I probably went down a bunny trail there, but I was just trying to flush out a thought. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, and there's, uh, I but, can't remember, I think you can't it's... give to everything. You're, you're giving a dollar here, a dollar there, you better just channel your efforts and give five dollars to something <laughs> more, more and more Christian, but well, if, if there I are... had a chance, it might go to work for the Veterans Administration, because I just... Yeah. <laughs> there are Christian organizations that, that do reach out to, to veterans. I think there's a, a Lutheran group, uh, Operation Barnabas, if I remember <coughs> that is this very thing. Oh, so we did veterans serving veterans, just getting yep. food. Yep. And, and that, and, and that, and, yep. and, and that, that's good. So it, it's it's worth us being aware, first of all, 
of the purpose of organizations, but realize that there are these organizations out there. They exist. Um, how many of you have heard of Operation Barnabas before today? We got one. Maybe ten and a half. Yeah. Uh, how do you know you can get to them unless you know they exist? Uh, so part of it is putting these things out. Maybe we'll do a, a drive for someone so you know not only I can support them, but hey, uh, it's in front of my face now, so I know for future reference if, if I need this resource, if I can give to a resource like this, if this is up my alley, then, then great. New and if I can proclaim unity here. New Hope is another one. New Hope, another veterans. New Hope, uh, new hope Center it used to be the uh, New Hope Shelter. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah. Yep. Almost, yeah. One thing I'm a little bit embarrassed about, I wish I would have followed through on the back of Pastor Hastings here where he's dead on Saturday, that's why I was And as I was driving to the session, I'd often see a homeless person pushing a shopping cart down the street. Mm -hmm. And I often thought, I need to stop and invite that person to have breakfast with us and invite them also to the Bible study. And that's reaching possibly to the on church person. Yeah. It's where a lot of this giving should be focused on, I think. Yeah. Um, as Paul is writing here, his his point is within the church, supporting those that we already have. But there is this responsibility that we have towards mission, towards going out and proclaiming uh, to those who don't yet know. And missions don't have to cost a whole bunch of money. The way we have structured our missions in today's day and age, it does. Because we've pushed that task off on a select few. You do the mission work, I'm going to sit here and make money and give you a little bit of that so that you can do missions and I'm not going to touch it. And there's a lot of administrative overhead as well. Yep. This organization. There is. Um, there's a way to do missions on the cheap for a Christian to act like a Christian and proclaim Jesus where you are. Um, now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't give towards missionaries and, and shouldn't go global. But we've been placed in this particular place for a reason at this time with these people around us. To, just to, to make two points that uh, Bob and all of me, the best place to go is your church. And the reason for that is the subsidiary principle. The money you spend, or if you're going to give to other local, make them local, yeah. the further you get, and this is true in government too, the money you spend in a local government is accountable. You know where it goes. You know, the people can know where every penny that is given to this church goes. It's completely transparent. If you go further out, and then when you get to the big ones, you have no idea yep. where that money ends up, whose pocket you're lying. And that's true with government, too. <coughs> the local government's most responsible. Your state government, eh, you get, you get to the federal government, you got no control at all. No check or balance on it whatsoever. It's just yep. pure yeah. draft and waste. Yep. And yep. that's true when you know, like my UNICEF and yep. things like that. Those big ones, man, those those big, if you look at their balance sheets, those uh, people are earning two hundred and fifty, three hundred thousand dollars a year out of that money. So you give them money and the kid in Africa gets up here. Right. Right. Yeah, one of the best organizations of so the World Relief. Yeah. The Lutheran Church World Relief. They, you know, even the secular people said that I think 92% or 92% go to the small percentage that goes to the operation. <laughs> Lutheran World Relief is up there, and uh, the Missouri Senate has its own organization. Uh, it's the uh, Lutheran Disaster Response. That it trains congregations, and when a disaster strikes, you've got a team within your church already ready and equipped to go out and serve the needs of those around you. Uh, I think of the people too. Uh, God said something about uh, 
people in the congregation or whatever. You know, we got, what, two couples in here that got sons that are pastors. I can't imagine what they've sacrificed. We have to get those boys into the, into the business, you know, of saving souls. You know, and that's, I mean, you, how do you count that? You don't. You know, you, you people know. But we could never go to this congregation in some of the I know, but it's, it's what a blessing, you know. You both, both people, you know, both couples have been like doing something like that, you know. Yeah. And you know, your parents had to sacrifice. You know, and it's not that's not on any balance books or things you know, <coughs> throw another you know, bar in the suit, you know, keep on going. It's the church saying we're in this together. Yeah. Which is what Paul's whole point is. We're in this together. Whether I'm here in Jerusalem, in Galatia, somewhere else in the Michigan district or across the Senate, we're in this together. And if we can support and encourage one another by giving gifts, um, by blessing others financially, <coughs> keep them blessed, what a testimony that is. If I can give away my money and say, God's going to be at work among you here, and, and we're behind you on this. Because that money doesn't just show up as, as the numbers in the bank account. It comes with prayer. It comes with awareness. It comes with relationships. And accountability. We're in this together. We're all part of this body of Christ. This is to say nothing about maybe the more direct applications here across cultural ministries. Poor uh, congregations, uh, maybe ethnic congregations. Uh, I know my home church in Lansing has a thriving Hmong ministry uh, that they share the space, help support, pay for their pastor because we're in this together. There's a specific community there that can be blessed. <coughs> um, at the seminary, they take they make you take a uh, a cross cultural uh, module they call it, um, where they send out seminarians to different uh, ethnic congregations. I went to a, a church that did a Chinese ministry. Um, a, a different experience. You get up to preach and you say a line and wait for them to translate it into Chinese and. Uh, you go through the whole service that way. And they had a hosting congregation that supported them. Seminary sent students to support them and, and bless their ministry. Uh, now, I don't know how much cross-cultural ministry there is in Cadillac, Michigan. Although, it exists. And especially across the state. There it does make the award through some of the charity and Christmas tree. Uh, and that's the thing that speaks Spanish so we can invite mm-hmm. them because I would say that's our biggest cross culture. Yeah. Down in Nunica, there was always a large portion of Hispanic people who came up for the fruit season. <coughs> they would come up primarily for blueberries in our area. There were some apples just north of us. Um, and how do you reach out if, if none of us speak the language? You know, if they're here for three or four months and gone, and, and when they're here, they're working. You know, how can we support them? How can we care for them? How can we give them Jesus while they're here? Um, we are more isolated out here in Cadillac than most places across the state. But that doesn't mean we should just sit on our hands and say, oh, I don't need to do anything. It's being present in the community, getting to know people who've been different than you so that you can care for them, support them, express our unity in the body of Christ. And it's that local. We're meeting those around us, the needs, needs I'm aware of, the needs I can meet, and, and I can have a conversation with someone. Tell them about Jesus. Any other thoughts on this one? That was a very fruitful discussion, so thank you for, I mean, quite literally, thank you for that. Um, I am grateful that we can have these conversations. Um, So, that all being said, we can finally move on to the next section here. Uh, Galatians 2, verses 11 through 14. 
And after that nice fruitful conversation, we get into conflict. Isn't that fun? <laughs> Can I have someone read these uh, few verses for us, please? But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him in his, to his faith, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically. Hypocritically, yeah. So that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But then, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to see this before them all. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Thank you. All right, so this section starts something new. It, it's kind of a, a different than what's come before. This is We talked last week that this is the fourth of four stories that's all lifting up the gospel, the role of the gospel. Um, first, this gospel came to Paul from outside of himself. It was revealed to him uh, when he was converted. And from there, he didn't go to, to check with anyone else. Uh, he just stood by himself, uh, went, uh, stayed in Damascus, went to Arabia for a while before being back in Damascus. He took one trip to Jerusalem, um, but that was just to really introduce himself to a church that before had only known him as a hostile enemy. Um, and at this point, the, the gospel of God himself was glorified because of Paul. It wasn't, hey, we're checking this out. It's uh, making sure you're on the right path. Hey, it's, and we're in this together. They know what's going on. God is praised for this. Uh, chapter 2, 1 to 10, which we just finished, was that first, um, uh, I guess the second visit to Jerusalem. Uh, whether it's the same as the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 is another question. Uh, we've got people on both sides of that question. In any case... Um, Paul goes, presents his gospel. He says he simply lays it out, and they added nothing to him. Even though there were false brothers, um, he has the true gospel. Um, there is no other gospel. What he has is the true one, and, and everyone recognizes it. But with these verses, 11 through 14 here, we get kind of a, a negative uh, uh, ex- exaltation of the gospel, if that makes sense. That the gospel is more important, is greater than even Peter himself, Cephas. Even the apostles are subservient to the word of God. Uh, if that means knocking down Peter, so be it. If he's proclaiming something other than Jesus crucified and risen, this freedom from the law, then we need to do something else here. Uh, So that seems to be the general flow of thought in the first couple chapters here. Um, Any questions that you have over these verses, anything that jumped out at you as you were reading them? Is there any special content in when it says Peter was eating with the Gentiles? Mm-hmm. I, does that just mean uh, was not observing the Jewish sacrifice or the Jewish dietary laws? Or is there any deeper than that? Yeah. So, this is going to be one of the big questions here. What exactly is is at issue. Why does Peter need to be corrected? Um, and and it's, it's because he was eating with the Gentiles. Some folks from James came, and he withdrew so that he would only eat with Jews with those who were circumcised. Um, 
The conversation so far in the book of Galatians has been about circumcision. Uh, Those who are circumcised. Uh, And yet, it seems to be the issue here at least starts with eating. With the, the dietary stuff. So this would be eating kosher. Only one kind of meat at a time. No meat and cheese together. Uh, no pork. Uh, and there's all sorts of rules about what you can and can't eat within the, the kosher system. We talked about it uh, a few months back as we were in the small catechism. We spent some time in First Corinthians as Paul uh, had to really correct them for their celebration of the Lord's Supper. Do you remember how that all played out? How did Corinth usually celebrate the Lord's Supper? They ate it. So, it was not just the Lord's Supper, but the Lord's Supper was a culmination of what they called the love feast. A fellowship meal that they all ate together and they were all in it and at the end of that was the Lord's Supper. This is where people were getting just fat off of the meal. Um, they're drinking all the wine, getting drunk. So when it comes time to, to communion, no one gets anything. When it comes time to, to drink the cup, well, someone already drank it. If this kind of love feast thing is going on here in Galatia as well, that might shine some extra light on on this eating versus not eating. If, and and there's speculation, I didn't take this or leave it, um, but if the eating was tied in with this love feast, you're in this together, we're, we're having a fellowship meal together, culminating in the Lord's Supper, Except now you're not. You step back, you refuse to, first of all, have this feast together, but then you're even refusing to come to the Lord's Supper together with us. Obviously there's red flags, there's something going on here. Now it might just be kosher at first, uh, or didn't worry about kosher laws with the Gentiles, and then when they did, he kind of did something separately, but it seems that he goes from eating with them to not eating with them. Not, we're going to eat with you and then only eat certain f- foods with you. It, it goes from together to apart. It goes from unified to divided. There is something in Cephas's actions that divide him from the church there in Antioch. Now, exactly whether it's kosher, whether it's the love feast, Lord's Supper, something else entirely... It, it almost is as, as almost is as if the issue itself doesn't matter. What matters is that Cephas is acting as a hypocrite, which seems to be the charge that Paul levels at him throughout this this text. These verses. Um, He drew back separated, fearing. The rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. Even Barnabas led astray by their hypocrisy, um, as we'll continue uh, next week at least with the rest of uh, chapter 2. Paul just lays into Cephas here, lays into Peter. You're saying one thing, you're living a different way. How can you call that right? Uh, we, we talked about this three or four weeks back. Uh, Paul almost exclusively, exclusively uses the name Cephas to okay. refer to this guy. Okay. Um, only twice in all of his letters, and it's only in Galatia, um, in Galatians here earlier, that he uses the name Peter. For whatever reason, Paul liked to call him Cephas. Um, the chances, at least the scholarship says, that when he calls him Peter, he's kind of reporting what others said. So it's, it's a little more verbatim. Um, maybe they use the name Peter as opposed to Cephas. Apart from that, I don't know. Yeah, it's one of those interesting details here yeah. that I don't know entirely what to make of that. Yeah. Since Paul got named to 
right? Do you think he would stick with the name Jesus? So, like, yep. Uh-huh. You would think. Uh, yeah, it's interesting because uh, yeah, Paul doesn't get a renaming ceremony either. It's just the book of Acts is going along, and it's Paul, and all of a sudden, Paul, who is also called, or Saul, who is also called Paul, and from then on, they just refer to him as Paul instead of Saul. So it's almost as if he had both names, but yeah, Cephas especially gets um, Simon, renamed Peter. Um, uh, Peter and Cephas uh, are the same word. <coughs> Cephas is Aramaic, Peter is Greek. Um, why does Paul use one or the other? I, yeah, I couldn't tell you. This, this whole thing that was Leonard and uh, Peter's actions here would have been subsequent to his vision of the yes. of the uh, yes. blanket coming down with all kinds of animals and stuff like that. Yep. I don't remember the particulars of that. He had yep. a vision, didn't he? That body, there's nothing cleaner, I'm cleaner, something. I believe that is Acts chapter 11. Let me double check on that. Because Paul is converted in chapter 9. Um, it's, it's chapter 10 of that. Um, so yeah, uh, there is... Peter is in Joppa, if I remember right. Uh, he's got this vision. because He's up on the roof in the middle of the day. There's a sheet that comes down from heaven full of all unclean animals. And a voice from heaven says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. How can I do that? I've never let anything unclean pass my lips. Uh, this happens three times. Uh, and at the end of each, don't call unclean what God has called clean. And at the end of that, he wakes up from this vision, and he's hearing a knock on the door. It's from a messenger from a bunch of Gentile Roman soldiers, actually. Cornelius is the guy. Goes further north and says, Hey, uh, we were told to come find you, and uh, you're going to tell us about this Jesus character and maybe lay your hands on us and give us the Holy Spirit? Okay. Um, and and it, it's that breakdown of there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's neither male nor field, female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We're all one in Christ. Christ makes this something new entirely. That's not Jew, that's not Gentile. You can be someone who has been a Jew or a Gentile that's, that's now a Christian. You can still have your identity, your way of life. But what primarily motivates you, what... Um, is your core, what makes you part of something new is Jesus. And yeah, so Peter here, he's, he should know better. You know, he should know Holy Spirit's for the Gentiles as well, we're in this together. Um, and yet he's acting like that's not true. Um, again, there's debate as to whether this is before or after the, uh, the council in Acts chapter 15, where again they discuss this issue. Uh, do we need Gentiles to be circumcised in order for them to be saved? The answer is no. Before or after that event, who knows, but Peter knows better. And so, to see his actions here, it really does highlight this hypocrisy going on. He knows better, but he's doing it anyway. Well, like yeah. Uh, so, he stood condemned for before certain men came from James, he was eating. When they came, he drew back. Um, what's this deal about men coming from James? Is James proclaiming a different gospel? What, uh, we talked about this last week, maybe the week before. What is uh, what does it seem that, that James' role is in the early church? Seems like he's the head. He's the he seems to be the head of the church. <laughs> he's the head of the church, at least in Jerusalem, if not the church. He's the guy. Um, it's not Peter, it's not Paul, it's not Barnabas, it's not anyone else. James seems to be the guy. So, are these messengers directly from James that are saying, Hey Peter, get your act together. 
is this just, hey, we were with James, and uh, we see you're doing things differently. Uh, you need to work on this. We don't have a whole lot of detail here as to why they've come, what their message is. Uh, it almost seems as if they've got something they're talking to Peter about and say, hey, uh, cut this out. You're causing trouble here. Why would eating with Gentiles cause trouble? You might have been eating the wrong, eating the wrong animal with a table book. Could have been a kosher thing. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't have a cloven hoof or has a cloven hoof but doesn't chew its cut or whatever the, the restrictions are. The ham tasted pretty good until the boss showed up. Yeah. Well, let's go back a little bit here to, um, to chapter 2. Um, the last few verses... They saw that Paul had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. So, it seems that Peter has a mission to those who are Jewish and Paul has a mission to those who are Gentile. trying to put the best construction on things, it is possible that folks have come from James to see Peter's actions and they say, Hey, Peter, your work up here eating with Gentiles, that breaking of kosher law, becoming unclean, that is damaging damaging your mission to those who are Jewish. Are they going to listen to you now that they know you eat with Gentiles? It, it, again, trying to put best construction on things, James may very well have had a good reason in his mind to say, hey, you need to pull back on this. For the sake of your mission, for the sake of what you're doing, step back. But it says that James pulled back from Right in the So, um, it doesn't say that James himself pulled back. Um, It's before certain men came from James, Paul was eating with the Gentiles. That's the he there in verse 12. James is the one who sent the men, not the one eating with Gentiles. Does that make sense? Just grammatically there. Um, So, let's... Put best construction on James' actions. Why is this a problem? Why does Paul have a problem with that line of reasoning? Because they're not preaching the gospel the way Christ wanted it. They're not preaching the gospel the way Christ wanted it? Paul says this is an issue of the gospel itself. This is not just an issue of kosher or not kosher. What is truly at stake is do we need someone to be circumcised to become Jewish in order to be saved? By Peter's actions, he's expressing whether he believes it or not, he's expressing that truth. Uh, to him, it was just or whatever. It's not a fact that uh, that notion. Um, instead of Christ is here for everyone to repent. So they're working out the relationship between law and God. Yes. Just like we used to last Yeah, absolutely. They're trying to properly distinguish between the two and, and to say when do we need one, when do we need the other, and how do the two work together. Uh, it seems at least James is having some questions about this. And Peter, it seems. He goes right along with it. And it's not just Peter. It's Peter. 
Um, it's Peter. Uh, so he separated. The rest of the Jews are in this. Even Barnabas is led astray. This is not just oh, Peter for the sake of his mission is stepping back, but he's taking people with him. The rest of the Jews, even Barnabas, is, again, playing the hypocrite. This hypocrisy is not credible. It says, you're saved by grace through faith, apart from your works, apart from your Jewish identity, but that still matters, and you need that in order to have true fellowship with us. That is a problem. Just as it's a problem for us if we say, yeah, you're saved by grace through faith, but you also need to officially join the congregation and vote in the voters meeting and give to our budget. Now, Christians should be doing these things. We should be part of local congregations. We should be supporting and caring for one another. But if that is a means of salvation, we've got a problem. Even if that is not what we say, it's just how we act. If that's the testimony we're giving by our actions, we've got a problem. It's a matter of the gospel here. How is a person saved? Paul was very clear it's only by uh, by Jesus, his death and resurrection, being Jewish, eating kosher, being circumcised, they're great things. Uh, He says in in the book of Romans, what advantage does... uh, does being circumcised have? Right in every way. Because it, it links you in with a lot of different things of, of history, of, of who you are personality-wise. But that has nothing to do with salvation. That has nothing to do with Christ's work for you. Uh, we need to be aware of what the main thing is. What is the gospel? And what's good and necessary in other ways, but not the gospel? We've got to specify. Where's gospel? Where's law? Where's gospel? Where's... Maybe just uh, the phrase for it is adiaphora. Something that is just indifferent, one way or the other. Um, it's not spoken of. That's the literal phrase here. Is, uh, is not uh, through... Spoken, not spoken through, not spoken about. Uh, do we have chairs or pews in the sanctuary? Color of paint and carpet. What was that? The color of paint and carpet. Yep. The Bible doesn't say one way or the other. If we say church has to have red carpet or green carpet, if you paint walls any other color, you're not really part of us. We got a problem. Um, we've got to recognize what's the important thing. Uh, and for Paul, it's this gospel, salvation by grace through faith. There's all sorts of stuff tied up with this. I'm not saying all you need is Jesus Christ crucified and risen for death the rest of the Bible. That's not what I'm saying here. That's not what Paul is saying. But what he is saying is, what is the core? What is it that shapes the entirety of who we are? And it's Jesus. Life, death, resurrection. That comes first, and that has implications for your Jewish identity, your Gentile identity. Um, in today's sermon, we would hear about a Samaritan woman, and there's a Samaritan identity that Jesus supersedes, he replaces. Uh, Jesus and the gospel makes all the difference. All right. We'll keep talk, talking about this next week. Um, we are over our time here. If you do have any other questions or comments, write them down and let me know after class or whatever, and we can start there next week. Otherwise, we'll wrap up now with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.